Yesterday, you witnessed the pain that comes along with losing love to a drunk driver. This afternoon, you will witness the events that follow that tragedy. A jury trial found Mr. Joyce guilty on all four criminal accounts. Two accounts of criminal vehicular homicide and two accounts of criminal vehicular injury. You will witness a sentencing hearing as it would take place for Mr. Joyce. From this moment on, you are in a courtroom. You will be treated as if you're in a courtroom, as if this is the real McCoy. State versus Joyce. Note your appearances, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sherry Townsend, appearing on behalf of the state, also present at council table, is Julie Ekstrom from Probation Services. Thank you. Thank you, Madam County Attorney, Council. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Attorney Gary Leakman for the defendant, Edward E. Joyce, who is standing beside me today. Hey, good afternoon. You may be seated. The above entitled matter duly came on for sentencing pursuant to a verdict of guilty on all four counts in a complaint on file with this court dated May 1, 2007, in which the defendant was charged with and convicted of count one criminal vehicular homicide in violation of Minnesota statute 609.21 subdivision one clause two subclause two and count two criminal vehicular homicide in violation of Minnesota statute 609.21 subdivision one clause two subclause two count three criminal vehicular operation resulting in substantial bodily harm in violation of Minnesota statute 609.21 Subdivision 2A, Clause 2, Clause 1. And Count 4, Criminal Vehicular Operation Resulting in Substantial Bodily Harm in Violation of Minnesota Statute 609.21, Subdivision 2A, Clause 2, Subclause 1. I have reviewed and received the pre-sentence investigation submitted by probation. Has the county attorney received that? We have, Your Honor. Thank you. Has defense counsel received it? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Ekstrom, are there any additions or corrections to the PSI, the pre-sentence investigation, from the probation department? Your Honor, I would just like to note that during the pre-sentence investigation with Ed, um, during our meeting, Ed showed very little remorse um, in regards to how the impact of his behavior has affected the victim's family. But otherwise, in regards to the recommendations, there are no further questions. Are there any additions or corrections to the pre-sentence investigation from the state? Any additions or corrections to the PSI from the defense? No, you are. With regard to disposition, are there any recommendations for sentence from the county attorney and from the state? Your Honor, as the court notes, there's a pre-sentence investigation, and the pre-sentence investigation recommends the guideline sentences for each count. Count one recommends a guideline sentence of 48 months uh, for criminal vehicular homicide involving the death of Andrea Bowerfield. Count two recommends 48 months for the criminal vehicular homicide of James Bolt-Yorkfield. Count three recommends one year plus one day for the injury suffered by Sandra Bolt. And count four recommends one year and one day for the injury suffered to Matt Levine. 
Uh, I would note, Your Honor, that the state is in agreement with the recommendations of the pre-sentence investigation. We would be requesting specifically that the counts, the sentences on each count be served consecutively for each individual victim. And we are requesting that the defendant be ordered to pay restitution to the victim's families, specifically uh, $7,500 in funeral expenses for Jaden Bjorkland, aged 10 years old at this time of death, and $8,250 for funeral expenses to Andrea Bowerfield's family. Uh, I would note, Your Honor, that restitution for victims Sandy Bolt and Matt Levine is yet to be determined, but they will have significant medical expenses that will need to be addressed by the defendant. If the court would like to hear from the state in regards to its basis for its request for sentencing, we'd be happy to uh, be heard at the appropriate time. And we also have victim impact statements from the Bauerfeld family and from the Bjorkland family when the court feels it's appropriate. Very well. Before I call upon the defense counsel for its recommendations, you may proceed with any victim impact statements or any other details as the basis of your recommendations, if you wish, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Go, go right ahead. I would note, Your Honor, that it would be easy for someone to attempt to portray this situation as a tragic accident. It was a tragic accident, but it wasn't completely accidental. This was a situation that was born out of the deliberate choices of the defendant, the choice to drink, the choice to drink to excess, the choice to drink and drive, the choice to get a blood alcohol concentration of near twice the legal limit, and the choice to be responsible for three other passengers in addition to numerous other drivers who were on the road that evening, including Randy Bjorkland and his 10-year-old son. This is not an accident. This is, this is a result of the defendant's choices. Two people are dead because of the defendant's choices, Andrea Bauerfeld and Jaden Bjorkland. Two others, Sandra Bolt and Matt Levine, will never be the same. They've had to have numerous surgeries. They have numerous fractures that they'll need to address and injuries that will last them a lifetime. The defendant had a lot of promise prior to this, certainly. Um, he had a high GPA, had college choices, he was the prom king, but that's not an excuse for the choices that he made on May 1st, 2007. In fact, the defendant had opportunities that many other people don't have, and he still made these reckless choices. The presumptive sentences are appropriate here, Your Honor. There are no substantial and compelling circumstances to depart downward, and consecutive sentences are absolutely appropriate. This should not be a four for one crime. The defendant should not uh, have killed two individuals and severely injured two other individuals and get one sentence to cover all of the damage that was done by, as a result of his choices. Um, the loss and the injury to each person and each family is immeasurable. There are no substantial and compelling circumstances to do anything but the presumptive sentence, Your Honor, and the consecutive sentences are appropriate considering the multiple victims and the individual impact that each uh, family will now suffer as a result of the defendant's actions and choices that night. And to illustrate, I'd like to read the victim impact statements from the Bauerfeld family and from the Bjorkland family. That's authorized by Minnesota state statute to uh, your allowed to do that, go right ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a, a victim impact letter from Warren Bauerfeld, the, fa the father of Andrea Bauerfeld. Dear Ed, I want you to understand what you've done. I want you to understand what you've taken away from my family and what you've taken away from me. When you killed my daughter, Andrea, you killed a part of me. You took a piece of me away and I can never get it back. The child whose hair I used to brush into ponytails, the child whose arms I would wrap, would wrap around my neck when she was little and she was tired of walking. The child who would ask me to read her a bedtime story even though she was old enough to read it herself. The child who turned into a bright, caring, beautiful young woman. She's gone, Ed. You took her away. I will not see my daughter graduate from high school this spring. I will not see my daughter head off to college this fall. I will never see my daughter play hockey again. I will never help her find her first apartment. I will never walk my daughter down the aisle of a church as she's about to be married. I will never see my daughter hold her own child. You took all of these things away from me, Ed, with your devil-may-care attitude and your casual approach to alcohol and drugs. You stole these things from Andrea as well. You robbed her of a future as she was about to embark on the most exciting time of her life. She was a girl who had everything going for her but, and nothing but a bright future ahead of her. She was so excited about starting school at Bemidji State and pursuing her dream of becoming a psychologist and working with kids. There is no doubt in my mind she would have achieved this goal. Andrea loved life. 
She lived for hockey, but she never forgot her friends, and she never forgot to stop and help those who needed her. She so enjoyed mentoring younger students and tutoring kids who needed a little extra help. Andrea loved to have fun. The times we spent at the cabin constantly in the water, tubing or skiing, the quiet nights spent looking at the stars and wondering about the universe, I will never forget that beautiful smile on her and her inquisitive mind. Andrea so looked forward to going to prom this year. Senior prom was a big deal, shopping for the perfect dress, making plans for the evening. We buried Andrea in that dress, Ed. You let me down, Ed. You let Andrea down, too. She liked you. She trusted you. She trusted you to be responsible, to be sober, and to be careful. And you violated that trust, Ed. Your own selfish desire to feel good and get high was more important to you than the safety of my daughter. I hope the court gives you a lot of time to sit and think about what you've done, Ed. I know I will be thinking about it every day. And it's signed by Warren Bauerfeld. This is a letter from Jill Bjorklund, the mother of Jaden Bjorklund, 10 years old. Dear Judge Pock, my precious gift from God is gone. My wonderful, precious child is gone. One minute he was here with me, singing a silly song to make me laugh, and the next minute he is gone. No warning, no preparation, no goodbye, just gone. My Jaden was a very special little boy, and I miss him so very much. He loved life, and he brought so much love into our lives. He was so looking forward to the coming summer, riding his bicycle, hanging out with his brothers, trips to the beach, spending time with friends. I still can't believe he's gone. Sometimes I find myself staring at the front door, waiting for Jaden to come bursting through, all excited, to tell me something about some new discovery or accomplishment. Sometimes if I'm near a playground or park, I think I'll hear him call my name. Or I might see the back of another child and for a moment think it's Jaden. And how can I ever make the pain go away for his two brothers? They lost their little brother. They used to love to pick on him, but that's just because they plain loved him. Our lives will never be the same. Our precious little boy is gone. No one can understand the pain. No one can understand the feeling of helplessness and the sense of loss. No one can comprehend the guilt I feel that if I had just seen the other car in time or just said something, or if I had altered my routine a little bit that day, Jaden might still be with us. I pray that someday I might find it in my heart to forgive Mr. Joyce, but for now, my heart is too full of pain to find any room for forgiveness. I know he didn't intend to hurt my Jaden, but he made choices that day. And now we will all have to live with the choices he made. Everyone, that is, except for Jaden. And it's signed, Jill Bjorkman. <coughs> Anything further on behalf of the state? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, Your Honor, I apologize. I would be requesting that the defendant's car be forfeited immediately and that the Department of Public Safety be asked to revoke his driving privileges permanently. Okay. All right. All right, counsel. Anything on behalf of the defendant? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Joyce is a good person. He made a terrible, terrible decision. I know the court has reviewed the pre-sentence investigation, as has the state. You then know that Mr. Joyce has significant ties to this community. He was born and raised here. His parents live here. His grandparents live here. He has no prior criminal record. He has no history of alcohol or drug abuse. He's a good student. He's been accepted to the university this fall on a full athletic scholarship, and he has a GPA of 3.7. Until this incident, he was a good citizen. Mr. Joyce is a young man who made a terrible mistake. He knows the presumptive sentence is 48 months per count for the two primary accounts. He pleads with the court for a downward deviation. He asks that any lockup time be served in the county facility and not in the state facility. He is extremely remorseful. He recognized that he had a bright future until this incident, and he urges the court not to take that future away by imposing the presumptive sentence. He lives with the knowledge that his actions have caused and had a devastating effect on the victim's family. 
He wishes he could undo what he did, but he knows he cannot. Rather than sentence him to extensive jail time, he would beg the court instead to provide for minimal incarceration and strict and extensive probation, which would include a significant amount of community service so that he can try to begin to pay his debt to society. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Liebman. All right, Mr. Joyce, you have a right of allocution, which means you have a right to say anything before a sentence is imposed. You can stand or, or be seated to do that. Is there anything you'd like to say before imposition of sentence? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to explain to the family how uh, sorry I am. I uh, didn't mean for it to happen. I know it's not that easy to understand that. I made a bad choice that their kids are dead. I'll do what I got to do to make it right, but they're never have their kids back. You can be seated. Let me review the probable cause and the complaint that was uh, signed by the chief investigator and authorized by the county attorney and signed by one of the judges of the district court. It reads as follows. State of Minnesota, County of Dakota, District Court, First Judicial District. State of Minnesota versus Edward E. Joyce. I, Steve Graven, I'm an investigator with the South St. Paul Police Department. I've investigated this matter, read the reports of others, and state the following to be true. On May 1, 2007, about 7 p.m., officers from the South St. Paul Police Department responded to a motor vehicle accident at the intersection of 3rd Street and 9th Avenue in the city of South St. Paul, Dakota County, Minnesota. <coughs> Responding officers found two vehicles, a Ford Escort and a Chevrolet Lumina, both heavily damaged. Officers determined that the Lumina was driven by an adult male. Randy Bjorklund. And J.B., the 10-year-old passenger and son of Randy Bjorklund, was dead at the scene of the accident. A.B., a 17-year-old female passenger in Joyce's vehicle, also died at the scene. Officers later determined that A.B. was not wearing a seatbelt at the time of the accident. Two passengers in Joyce's vehicle, S.B. and M.L., were also transported uh, to the Regina Hospital, where they were treated for multiple fractures, lacerations, and contusions. Officers at the scene were able to speak with Joyce, who was not seriously injured. When they spoke with Joyce, officers detected a strong odor of alcohol coming from Joyce. Joyce's eyes were glassy and his speech was slurred. A peace officer performed the horizontal gaze nystagmus test on Joyce and detected distinct nystagmus at maximum deviation. Several field sobriety tests were administered, and Joyce wasn't able to perform any of them successfully. Joyce told officers he had consumed, quote, a few beers, close quote, early in the evening. Joyce was transported to a Regina Hospital where a blood sample was obtained. The sample was taken to the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, whose analysis revealed a blood alcohol content of 0.15%. Officers from the Minnesota State Patrol conducted an accident reconstruction of the accident scene. They determined that Joyce's vehicle was traveling east on 3rd Avenue and went through a stop sign. Bjorklund was going north on 9th Avenue when the vehicles entered the intersection. The Lumina then struck the escort in the rear passenger area where the 10-year-old child was seated. Witnesses at the scene stated Joyce failed to stop. Bjorklund had the right of way. Your expression of remorse is the first one that I've heard from you at any time in the trial or at any time. And it's certainly the first one the probation officers heard. Because during the pre-sentence interview and the pre-sentence investigation, there is no remorse shown whatsoever. This is a, more than a tragedy. An accident by definition isn't something that's intended to happen. But when you deliberately drink, when you deliberately think drugs are no big deal, this is the result. You know, there's no such thing as a designated driver. Under 21, it's illegal, and it's wrong, and it's against the law to consume any alcohol or have any controlled substance, even prescription in your blood system, and then drive. 
The date wasn't buckled in, not drinking, but on her way to Bemidji School next year. But you, was, you decided it was okay just to have a few drinks. Well, that few drinks made it almost twice the legal limit of 0.08. I need to tell you, 1974, I was on active duty with the Navy and on the carrier United States ship USS Enterprise. Just before I reported to that ship, it went to general quarters, I mean, it's battle stations. That aircraft carrier is four football fields long. From the keel to the stack, 15 stories high, with a full air wing of nine air squadrons, 5,000 ship's company and uh, squadrons aboard. They serve 15,000 meals a day. They can go at a classified speed that you can water ski behind barefoot. The propellers on that ship are behind four rudders, 25 feet in diameter. When they went to general quarters in the four manual steering compartments in the bowels of the ship, simulating knocking out all the hydraulics and all the electronics, they gave the command, all right, all to starboard. One, two, and four right went to starboard. Number three went to the left. He was high on marijuana with a beer. Five years, Leavenworth military disciplinary barracks, one mile from the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas. Not in my Navy, not in my Marine Corps, not in my county. When you get behind the wheel, you're driving a 3,000 pound missile. I know that your lawyer would like to turn back the clock, and I knew you wish you could. But all the powers in nature where they conspire on your behalf could not make it undone. You can't bring back that life, those words, that decision to drink. And I'm sure you won't ever forget it. And I wish I would have had a chance to talk to you before your prom, because this is what I would have told you. Refuse to be controlled by the situation. You control the situation. Remember the poem by Rudyard Kipling, if, if you can keep your head when all those about, you are losing theirs and blaming on, on you, then you, my son, can call yourself a man. And it applies to each one of us every day in our daily life, in school, at work, at church, in vacation, in college, any place. Remind yourself of what you believe and what you know. Because obedience and little things bring, bring blessings in the big things. And if you had come to me before your prom, I would have explained to you that if you ever have something to drink and hurt or maim or kill someone, you'll never get over it. And I would have had a chance to tell you beforehand, but now it's too late. You made the choice, you knew it was wrong, you knew it was against the law, but you thought it was no big deal. Well. You're going to face a real sentence, not a peer court sentence, not a juvenile sentence, not any other sentence. And I wish I had a chance to tell you before your prom something that could well have been written by your date, by Andrea. Please God, I'm only 17. The day I died was an extraordinary day. It was prom. My hair was done, I had a new dress, pictures all around, the walk down the gym, and dinner and the dance. How I wish I had my parents' advice and taken my parents' advice and let them arrange rides for us, but I was too cool for that. Besides, Ed had a souped up car he just got. Special favor, Mom, I pleaded. Please, Dad, all the kids are driving, we'll be okay. When Ed picked me up, my parents took some pictures, then we were off, free. Doesn't matter how the accident happened. He had only had a couple of drinks. He said he felt okay. He said he only had a couple of drinks and it made him feel good. It didn't really affect him. Then he started goofing off, going too fast, taking chances, not paying attention. I trusted him. But I was enjoying my freedom and having fun. The last thing I remember was passing an old lady who seemed to be going awfully slow with uh, some kids in the back of the car. I heard the deafening crash and felt a terrible jolt. Glass and steel flew everywhere. My whole body seemed to be turned inside out. I remember being thrown forward. Neither of us had our seat belts on. We didn't want to wrinkle our dress and tux. Ed said we didn't need to buckle up. 
How I wish I'd listened to my parents to always buckle up. How I wish I'd listened to my parents to call if I needed a ride, that they'd come and pick me up any place, any time, no questions asked. We'd talk in the morning, but that wasn't cool. I heard myself scream. Suddenly I awakened. It was very quiet. A police officer was standing over me. Then I saw a doctor. My body was mangled. I was saturated with blood. Pieces of jagged glass were sticking out all over. Strange that I couldn't feel anything. Hey, don't pull that sheet over my head. I can't be dead. I'm only 17. I've got a date tonight. I'm supposed to grow up and have a wonderful life. I haven't lived life yet. I can't be dead. <clears throat> Later, I was placed in a drawer. My folks had to identify me. Why did they have to see me like this? Why did I have to look at my mom's eyes when she faced the most terrible ordeal of her life? Dad suddenly looked like an old man. He told the man in charge, yes, she's my daughter. The funeral was a weird, weird experience. I saw all my relatives and friends walk toward the casket. They passed by one by one, and they looked at me with the saddest eyes I've ever seen. Some of my friends were crying. A few of the guys touched my hand and sobbed as they walked away. Please, somebody, wake me up. Get me out of here. I can't bear to see my mom and dad so broken up. My grandparents are so racked with grief, they can hardly walk. My brother's like a zombie. He moves like a robot. Everybody's in a daze. No one can believe it, either. Please don't bury me. I'm not dead. I have a lot of living to do. I want to laugh and run again. I want to sing and dance. Please don't put me in the ground. I promise if you give me one more chance, God, I'll be the most careful driver in the whole world, and I promise I'll buckle up and not ride with anyone who's been drinking or doing drugs. All I want is one more chance. Doesn't that sound like Andrea? Anything further? Nothing further, Your Honor. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, you. the defendant will rise. <coughs> you, Edward E. Joyce, have been found guilty by a jury of all four counts in a complaint on file with this court dated May 1, 2007. It's hereby a judge and determined that you're guilty of all four counts. Criminal vehicular homicide as charge in count one and the death of Jaden Bjorklund. Criminal vehicular homicide is charged in count two in the death of Andrea Bauerfeld. Criminal vehicular operation resulted in substantial bodily harm, resulting in substantial bodily harm to Sandra Bolt. Count four, criminal vehicular operation resulting in substantial bodily harm to Matt Levine. It's the judgment of the court and sentence of the law that as punishment, therefore, you be sentenced pursuant to the Minnesota sentencing guidelines to a period of 48 months on count one to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections of the State of Minnesota there to be received, kept, and employed until duly discharged by due course of law or competent authority. On count two, it's hereby a judge you're guilty of that offense, and it's the judgment of the court and sentence of the law that you be sentenced to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for the State of Minnesota for a period of 48 months, there to be received, kept, and employed until duly discharged by due course of law or competent authority. It's further the judgment of the court that it is hereby determined that you're guilty of count three, criminal vehicular operation resulting in substantial bodily harm and pursuant to the Minnesota sentencing guidelines with a maximum three-year sentence. It's the judgment of the court and sentence of the law that you be sentenced to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections of the State of Minnesota to a year plus one day, there to be received, kept, and employed until duly discharged by due course of law or competent authority. It's further ordered that it's hereby judged and determined that you're guilty of count four, criminal vehicular operation resulting in substantial bodily harm and you're sentenced to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections of the State of Minnesota for a period of a year and a day. The custody of the Commissioner of Corrections is there to be received, kept, and employed until duly discharged by due course of law or competent authority. It's further ordered that the sentences shall be served consecutively for a total of 10 years in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. You must serve at least two-thirds of the sentence in custody and at least one-third on uh, parole or supervised release. It's further ordered that you pay restitution to the victim's families for funeral expenses in the amount of $7,500 for the funeral expenses of Jaden Bjorklund, $8,250 for funeral expenses for Andrea Bauerfeld, 
for a total of $15,750 in restitution. The judgment is entered against you in a civil judgment in the amount of $15,750 payable to the families as indicated previously for restitution to be taken from prison wages. And if it's not all paid in prison wages within the 10 years, a judgment against you which may be docketed and uh, forfeited against you. It's further ordered that your car be forfeited immediately, that your plates be forfeited, that you be permanently revoked from driving a motor vehicle in the state of Minnesota forever. It's further ordered that the applicable surcharges apply in this case, and since they're all imposed on the same date, one surcharge is imposed. The defendant's remanded to the custody of the sheriff for transportation to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections of the state of Minnesota forthwith. Court will be in recess, but before we do, I need to tell you something. I need all of you to sit up straight and listen for just a moment. You have something no other school has. You're Packers. And there's nothing quite like a Packer, I think you would agree. When I was out at the United States Naval Academy, I can tell you that the midshipmen at the Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland have an honor code. It's this, a midshipman is a person of integrity. A midshipman does not lie, cheat, or steal. A midshipman does that which is right. I have a feeling whether you have a formal honor code here that you could say the same thing. A packer is a person of integrity. A packer does not lie, cheat, or steal. A packer does that which is right. I can talk until uh, the end of the hour, but it wouldn't change the fact that you can't bring back a life. And I need to tell you something else. There are 33 judges in the first judicial district. We cover seven counties and nine courthouses. Earlier last month, I sentenced a burglar to 38 years in prison. He doesn't get out for 25 years, four months. He's a career offender. All of the judges and all of your teachers and all of your parents want me to tell you, we love you. We want you back Monday morning. And I'm not a teacher and I'm not a principal, so I can say what I'm gonna say. We love you, God bless you, have a wonderful time. And I wanna see all of you back Monday morning. Have a wonderful prom, have a safe prom. Do what's right. We'll stand in recess. <clears throat>